Thank you all for joining us for this uh, presentation by Dr. Ashwini Deshpande, is Professor of Economics and the founding director of the Center for Economic Data and Analysis at Ashoka University. Her PhD and early publications have been on the international debt crisis of the 1980s. Subsequently, she has been working on the economics of discrimination and affirmative action with a focus on caste, gender in India. She has published extensively in leading scholarly journals. She is the author of Grammar of Caste, Economic Discrimination in Contemporary India, Oxford University Press, New Delhi, uh, and Affirmative Action in India, Oxford University Press, New Delhi. Uh, she's the editor of several volumes and is currently editing the Handbook of Economics of Discrimination and Affirmative Action to be published as a part of the Springer Major Reference Works. She received the Exim Bank Award for Outstanding Dissertation, uh, now called the IRA Award in 1994, and the 2007 VKR, VKRV Rao Award for Indian Economists Under 45. Uh, and, and briefly about the co-author, Mr. Jitendra Singh is a PhD candidate in, in the Department of Economics uh, at Ashoka. His research agenda broadly spans the field of development economics and political economy. His current research empirically examines how social entities in India, namely gender, caste, religion, determine labor market outcomes and economic welfare. Uh, so the style of this presentation and questions will be uh, such where Dr. Uh, Deshpande will give the talk uh, and you can write me your questions in the chat box and it's the presentation will be say 30, 40 minutes and then we can have a q and A. I'll call you out. Or, or you can then raise your hands directly if, if, if that's okay. So yes, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, and as you see, my co-author uh, Jitendra is also here. Um, I am uh, going to, so this the slides are full of a lot of technical detail, but I might skip those you know slides and we can come back to that in q and I want to make the, the larger argument of this paper, I want to spend time on the larger argument of this paper. Uh, what is this paper trying to examine? It's examining the phenomenon of low and declining female labor force participation rate in India, uh, which has you know, been persistently low and the last 20 years or so, it's been declining, right? Uh, and labor force participation rate is, a binary indicator, which means either you are in the labor force or you're out of the labor force. Now, when uh, uh, it comes up in the question of, in the context of women, even though whether an individual is in the labor force or not is a function of both the availability of work as well as the individual's willingness to work. But often in the context of women, when women's labor force participation rate declines, it is seen as a problem of women withdrawing from the labor market altogether. That is, they don't want to work or they are not allowed to work. And that is the real, uh, you know, the manifestation of that is seen in low labor force participation rates. Now, labor force participation rate, as I will, uh, as we we'll show in the next slide again, is a combination, is a sum of people working actually with jobs, that is employed individuals, as well as unemployed individuals, that is involuntarily unemployed, which means individuals who would like to work, are looking for work, willing to work, but are unable to find work. Now, for surveys to capture this such a person, uh, this person would have to respond to the surveyor, I am willing to work, I'm able to work, I'm looking for work, but I'm not finding work. So therefore, I'm unemployed. Women generally tend to report lower rates of unemployment. So if you find a woman who is currently not employed, there is a very high chance that she'll say, I'm just not working, rather than saying, I'm actually in the job market looking for work, and I'm currently unemployed. Men tend to say that more openly. So when women's labor force participation rate drops, there could be, uh, it could be just an increase in unemployment, which gets registered as 
an increase in women leaving the labor force because they don't declare themselves as openly unemployed. Now, you know, the labor market has a supply side and a demand side. A supply side of the labor market is individuals supplying their own labor, right? And factors that determine uh, individual supply of labor. So in the literature on the analysis of Indian women's low labor force participation rate, the supply side factors dominate the explanations. They dominate the literature. So women get married and they can't work, so they drop out. Uh, uh, women become mothers, they can't work, they drop out. Uh, there are conservative social norms that prevent women from working, they drop out, they don't work. Uh, there could be sexual violence at the workplace or on the way to the workplace as a result of which women drop out of the labor force. There could be, and it is true that women who are working for a wage outside the home are stigmatized. So it's seen as uh, a failure on the part of the man that he couldn't earn enough for the family, that the woman had to go out and earn. So it's, it's a stigmatizing um, feature and women who are uh, not prepared to tolerate that stigma will, will probably not work. Then there are what feminist economists call demands of reproductive labor, which means not just the act of reproduction, which is not just the act of giving birth to children, but the, that plus taking care of children, taking care of the elderly, cooking, cleaning, um, house maintenance, fetching water, getting the homework done, you know, taking children to different activities. And so there's a whole gamut of work that gets done in homes uh, that is, uh, you know, usually branded these days as care work, but it's much more than care work. And that is known as reproductive labor. So if women are, uh, uh, you know, uh, if the predominant responsibility of getting the reproductive labor done is of women, then they are less likely to be able to go outside the home and work in paid employment. So these are all the supply side reasons for um, why women uh, are not working or are dropping out of the workforce. Any of these could worsen as a result of which uh, women will drop out of the workforce. All of these are real issues. They exist. They shape and circumscribe women's lives in a variety of ways. So there's no doubt that these, these issues are important. The question is, do they explain the decline in labor force participation rates? That's really the question we need to ask ourselves. So that's what this paper tries to do. So in, you know, you probably have heard about the National Sample Survey, NSS, that does these repeated employment and unemployment surveys. Now you have periodic labor force surveys. Um, and there are individual, uh, you know, private surveys, like, for example, I had done one with Naila Kabir in West Bengal, um, that asked women the following question, if work was made available at or near your home, would you do it? Would you take it up? Right. And an overwhelming majority uh, of women say yes to that, uh, answer yes to that question. Some, of, some women are looking for full-time work. Some women, women are looking for part-time work. Some are looking for regular full-time or part-time work. Some are looking for occasional full-time or part-time work. But there is a huge unmet demand for work. Okay, um, And in India and in South Asia, and India and Pakistan in particular, uh, the predominant responsibility of reproductive labor, domestic chores, is with the woman. So the, either the woman has to do it herself or she has to get it done. But either way, the responsibility lies with the woman, right? And India and Pakistan are particularly unequal in terms of division of re reproductive labor between men and women compared to other countries in the world. So there is a very high uh, responsibility, very onerous responsibility of getting reproductive labor done. And therefore the whole what this means is that if there's work available, which is far away from home, women are not going to be able to access them because even if they work outside the home, they are still expected to either get the work done or do it themselves. So that, that's, that's a lot of pressure, which, which uh, doesn't allow women to access work. This is of course provided work is available and we'll come to that question a little bit later. 
Now, in India, we don't have really uh, what is called panel data, which is longitudinal data, which means the same person studied over a period of time. Right? So when you have surveys like NSS or National Family and Health Survey or uh, IHDS is a panel. Uh, but so what it is, is every time a new sample is drawn and the survey is conducted for the next round, again, a new sample is drawn. So it's not the same people who are interviewed. It, who are um, interviewed. In developed countries, however, there is a lot of panel data, longitudinal data available. And what that shows, because you can track the same women over time, what that shows is that women transition in and out of the labor force more than once in their lifetimes. The same woman will be in the labor force at one time and not in the labor force at another time. Okay, that's that's not captured that. NSS cannot capture that because uh, it is not a panel data. It's not longitudinal data. So Jitendra um, uh, asked this question. Yeah, sure. Could Indian women be exhibiting similar transitions? And if they do, what, what factors might, um, would underlie these transitions? And of course, they're both supply and demand side factors and they're both interlinked. But what we wanted to understand in this was which of these factors uh, are amenable to policy intervention. Now, we were lucky to uh, have access to uh, data from the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, CMIE. It's, they have a data set called Consumer uh, Pyramids uh, Household Survey. Uh, and what this does is, uh, in the, if you're familiar with this data set, then you would know that every four months a round of this data set is, uh, is available. So individuals or families get uh, tracked three times in a year. Every four months, they have a, what they call a wave, a round, all right? So we used uh, uh, this data from January 2016 to December 2019, which is pre-COVID because COVID was unusual. And uh, we wanted to look at the pattern before COVID. So because every year has uh, three waves and there are four years. So we have data for 12 waves over four years. Okay. Now this data set allows us to look at the employment status of the individual. What are the categories here? One is employed, straightforward. Uh, one is the, that's number one. Number four is unemployed. That is not working in paid employment, not willing to work, not looking to work, not looking for work. So these are straightforward, employed, and out of the labor force. Then there are two other categories. One, which is called employed, unemployed currently. So uh, CPHS data asks about employment status of the previous day. So it's like a, those who know NSS, it's like a daily status um, employment rate. So there's a category called unemployed, willing to work, looking for work. Second is, the number three here is unemployed, willing to work, not looking for work, which means Yesterday, I did not do anything actively to look for work. But that could happen. I mean, those of us who have uh, been unemployed at any point would know that in general, you keep looking, but it's possible that there might be a day on which you don't really look that day or for a few days. So we uh, took categories two and three and classified them as um, unemployed, that is involuntarily unemployed, okay? Uh, four is straightforward, that's out of the labor force, OLF. And first is the category one is employed. So one plus two plus three gives us people who are in the labor force. Because remember in, in the labor force are those individuals who are employed as well as unemployed, right? So that's how uh, the categories got created. Now, this is a picture of female uh, employment and labor force status uh, in CMI data. Now you focus here on the green line and you see a decline both in urban and rural areas, which of course is a little bit different from if you plotted the decline for NSS. It doesn't, in NSS, the bulk of the decline is from rural areas, not really urban. Okay. Uh, but here you see actually a sharp decline both in urban as well as in rural areas. Okay. Uh, so exact, exactly what I said, female labor force participation rate declined from 22 to 12.8% in rural and to 11% in urban. So it's a feature more of um, 
uh, uh, CMI data. Now, the previous graph tells us that the decline in female labor force participation rate is primarily due to a decline in unemployed women, right? So this is what I was talking about earlier, which is that you might be actually willing to work and in principle looking for work. But if the labor market is tight, if you feel that you can't, then you will not even, women will not even declare themselves as unemployed, right? And so if they don't declare themselves as unemployed, then they are seen as out of the labor force, right? So uh, the decline in female labor force uh, participation rate could just be simply a reflection of what is called a discouraged worker effect, which is you want to work, there isn't enough work available. And you say, okay, well, I'm just not even going to declare myself unemployed, even though sometimes you might have uh, even registered on an employment portal. But when the surveyor comes, you say, no, I'm not working. Women tend to do that more than men do. Okay. The fact that there is a jobs crisis, I mean, we have other evidence as well, but even here you see that male LFPRs uh, also declined in, um, in CMI data, but the magnitude of decline uh, was five percentage points. And mainly it was due to a decline in employment rates for men. All of it pointing to the same issue really. Okay, and this is decline in rural. So this is the male picture. So you see, there's a, you know, you see the green line, you see a much uh, smaller decline over the period where you saw a sharper decline for women. <clears throat> Okay, maybe I'll skip this, but, we, but what this is trying to do is really to look at individuals um, across weeks. So say, let's say an individual was ob observed first in January, all right? That individual will now be observed in uh, May, okay? Then that individual will be observed in uh, September and so on. Right? So what you do is you look at the individual status in each of the waves and check whether the individual entered the labor force, which means that in the previous period, that person was out of the labor force. And in, in period T plus one, that person is in the labor force, that would be called an entry. And an exit would be the opposite, which is that you were in the labor force uh, in period T, and then you were not in the labor force in T plus one. So what does that picture, I mean, that we have many pictures, but I'll just show you one. What does that picture look like? All right. Now, the each for each period, we have the male graph, male bar, and the female bar. Now, focus on the first set of bars, January to April 2016. Uh, the blue is the mean of those who are in the labor force, which is the labor force participation rate. Okay. So what, uh, and, the, and the red is um, <clears throat> our exit rate. These are, this is the graph for exit rate. So see, for example, the female bar for the January to April uh, 16 period. What this is telling you is that the female labor force participation rate was 22%, okay? Of this, about 36%, which is 0 0.079 of 0 0.22, had left the labor force when they were observed in the next wave. Okay, so in each period, you see some exit of men and women because you have these red bars uh, in each uh, ways. But similarly, when you plot entry rates, in each period, you see entry of people into the labor force. So again, look at the female bar for the first period, January, January to April 2016. 78% of working age women were out of the labor force. Okay, but of them, 9% rejoin the labor force in the next period. So what you're seeing is really uh, repeated entry and exit into in and out of the labor force for both men and women, okay? The average exit rate for women is 30%, okay? That means 30% leave in each period, 70% remain. The exit rate for women is six times higher than that for men. 4% women who were out of the labor force in the previous period join in the next period. And entry rate for men is four times higher than it is for women. So these are the gender gaps in entry and exit rates, okay? Now, when you say percent 
this percent, that percent. Remember that the numbers are very different because 4% OLF women joining in the next period is 4% calculated on a much larger base, much larger number of women who are out of the labor force. So basically the point is that in every, on average, a large number of women are also joining the labor force in every uh, wave, just as they're exiting. But this picture you cannot see in NSS. Okay, so you can actually plot the total number of transitions for rural and urban uh, men and rural and urban uh, women. Okay, and this, we did this using uh, individuals who were seen in all the 12 waves, right? So women can, some women make up to even eight rural women can make up to even eight transitions over 12 periods. So they are entering and exit, exiting, entering and exiting uh, repeatedly. Okay, that just this fact should make you think that it cannot be a lot of those supply side factors that, that we mentioned earlier in one of the slides, because these, those things don't change so, repeat, so rapidly. Okay, some more data on transitions. Maybe I'll, I'll skip this, it's too much detail. I'll, I'll focus on the last uh, point, which is our interpretation of this repeated entry and exit is the following, which is this wide, widespread informalization precarity of labor markets. And men have to work out of compulsion, uh, but women join the labor force or work only when it is available and it's compatible with domestic choice. But men have to, they have no, you know, they have to do whatever it is that they need to do uh, to earn a livelihood. Okay. Now we also went into whether it's actually transitions or self-reporting. I'll skip this slide. Um, the conclusion of which is women are frequently joining and leaving the labor force. Okay. What explains this? What do these indicate, the frequent transitions? Is it just self-reporting? No. Is it seasonal? In other words, when there's agricultural <coughs> cycles that require uh, women's labor, uh, do they enter? And then when that work is over, do they leave? No, it's not seasonal. Uh, there is a theory in, um, in economics which talks about women's low attachment to the labor market. It's believed that women are uh, more attached to the family and homes and work you know, either out of compulsion or interest, but are not really that attached. So they're willing to just give up their jobs and sit at home. Uh, we don't think so. Why? Because 36% um, women make two switches, 25% make three switches over four years. And if you do the caste breakup of these switches, then you find that 34 and 25% of SC and ST women respectively make three switches compared to 19% of upper caste. These are groups that are, um, uh, A, the question of attachment even doesn't even exist because these groups are relatively poorer and often they have no choice but to actually go out and work to earn a living, right? And so, and also taboos on working outside the home are almost non-existent for, the, for these caste groups. So if they are making these repeated switches, it must mean that they work when they can work and when they can't, they, they don't. So, the low attachment story doesn't really hold. Group, I said this already. Groups with higher labor force participation rates and fewer taboos make more a greater number of switches. These are also groups that are poorer and in precarious employment. And what this suggests is the fractured nature of work availability, not low attachment. So this is a picture of the number of transitions by groups. And so finally, we come to this graph which shows, you know, if you look at the female, the, the last, the right side two graphs, you see that in CMI data, on average, the female labor force participation rate is 13% in urban and 16% in rural over the period where we've looked at, uh, calculated. But if you count the proportion of women who are at least once in the labor force in these 12 waves, that's 44%. Okay, and this is when the CMI definition of work is much more restrictive than any other data source. So their labor force participation rate estimates are always lower than any other data set. But we haven't tinkered with the definition. Just even using CMI's restrictive definition of being 
in the labor force. Just using this phenomenon of switching, we see that 44% women are um, in the labor force. The reason that they show up as not in the labor force has to do with at what point um, they were captured uh, and also the fractured uh, availability. So I can talk more about how NSS measures work and how why fractured availability of work might affect that, but I'll, I'll leave that. It's a bit of a nerdy, uh, a nitpicky kind of an issue, but basically that's that's really what it is. Okay, then there is uh, there's more, you know, analysis that looks at determinants of entry, determinants of exit. You know, we run a regression. Uh, we look at what are the factors we look at. We look at, for example, did um, were women pushed into work? In other words. Was there a change in the income of other household members? Okay. Did male unemployment in the family increase? Did the number of children below five years increase? And so on. These are the usual suspects for why women might be uh, uh, pushed out to work. And you see that these factors are important, that they're not completely unimportant. But uh, when you look at the, I'm just going to show you, what is the total effect of these factors? So the, there is a marginal effect, which is an increase in male unemployment uh, increases the probability of women being in the labor force. Uh, a, 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 a decline in uh, household income increases the probability of women being in the labor force. So there is a marginal um, uh, impact. But what is the uh, overall, overall, how much of the decline in LFPR do these factors um, explain? So in our data, for women, entry rate is 4%, exit rate is 3%. Okay, The presence of male unemployed members increases the probability of entry by between 3.6 and 5.5 percentage points, depending on our specification. And it decreases the probability of exit by between 9.6 and 21.6 uh, percentage points. Okay, The probability that working age women have at least one male unemployed member in the household is uh, 7.4%. Okay. So when you combine these probabilities, then it appears that a maximum of 0.4% of entry and 1.6% of exit rate in each period can be determined, for example, by the presence of unemployed males. So the push factor. Right. So this is not to say that these explanations are not important, but the quantum, the magnitude of the decline that we see uh, uh, is, is not, you know, is, is very little. Similarly, uh, we can look at the uh, income effect uh, and we see that it's not, not very big. Okay, how much? I probably have five minutes more or something? No, no, you have uh, uh, 10 minutes. 10, 10 minutes more, okay. So the other, one of the other questions we look at is the motherhood penalty. Okay, this is a phenomenon again observed um, in uh, labor markets around the world. Again, for this, you need individual level panel data because you need to be able to observe individuals before the birth of a child and after the birth of a child. And what does the motherhood penalty literature in the <clears throat> developed countries tell us? If there are negative labor market outcomes, LFPRs, uh, wages, earnings, occupation for women compared to men. So the birth of a child impacts the mother negatively, but not the father. So we look at uh, consumer pyramids household survey data, and uh, we can identify a new child in the household um, for women who are spouses of heads of household or are heads of household themselves, because the relationships in the data are defined in relation to the head of household. Okay, so how do we define a new child? Um, we def because the surveys are done at different points in time for the same family. So we define a new child as, as a situation where the child was observed for the first time in the household at an age less than 12 months. Because it's possible also that the mother had gone you know, for childbirth to her parents' house, then came back. So whenever we see... Um, a child in the household at less than 12 months, then we define that as a new child. 
And we find in our data set, there are 3,000 mothers with new child. And then of course, what is the comparison group? The comparison is either mothers uh, with no child below five years. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, this is what the results we are presenting. But, you know, in economics, people are concerned about selection, which is that it's possible that mothers of new children might just be, have different characteristics than mothers with no new children. In other words, even if the child had not been born, these mothers might have had lower LFPRs, right? Because they were just different kinds of individuals. So there's a technique that allows us to match the women with no new children with women with new children in a way that we make them otherwise e equivalent. So the caste distribution, the religious distribution, rural urban distribution, age distribution, education. So we match them on those characteristics. And so now we are looking at equivalent groups of women, one group with new children, another group with no new children. All right. And um, so we have new mothers, new fathers. The green line is new fathers, the blue line is new mothers. And then red line is comparison women and mustard line is comparison men. So you really see uh, that basically what it is, is that women who are new mothers just have a lower labor force participation rate throughout. So these are almost parallel lines. And for fathers, it's flat, nothing, you know. You don't see any difference. And so we can look at the point where the child was born. Um, yeah, this is the picture. They are very similar. You can look at all the pictures. But basically, this is the picture that I want to show you for uh, uh, um, examining the child penalty. So look at the line zero. All right. And the green dots are the point estimates. Okay. And the those horizontal lines are the confidence intervals. Now, if that line crosses zero, which means that it's not significantly different from zero. Now, what is not significantly different from zero? Okay. Now, the number zero here is the point at which the child was born. That is when we observe the child for the first time. And you look at three waves before this, all right, um, which is about 12 months before the child birth. And that is our point of reference. So what we want to see is, do we see a, a clear decline in women's labor force participation rate defined by the entry of a new child, which is what you see in the West, but you don't see that. You see before and after, and by before, I mean the period of comparison is 12 months before the actual child is born, right? And so you don't really see um, the motherhood Penalty, uh, there's a, I'll skip this. There's a technique called blinder Ohaka decomposition. Uh, I'll skip this. Now I'll come to the last, pa last part of, our, of the discussion, which is really what is the issue that we are facing in India for everyone, for all workers? And that is the issue of jobless growth. Okay. So here's a picture that you should look at, which is, this goes back now to, this is not from CMI, this is from government data, from RBI data. Look at this plots the pick time period from 1980 to 2018. Look at the red line, which is the population in the working age group. It's steadily monotonically increasing. Look at the blue line, which is the total employment in millions. It's much flatter. And after 2004, it really is uh, it just, you know, there are periods of decline or it's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost flat. And if you went beyond 2018, you will actually start seeing a bigger decline. Really, almost from 2014 or so, you see start seeing a decline, uh, which will become sharper if the scale is, uh, gets changed. Right? So this is the problem, that there isn't enough work to absorb um, the increase in working age pop population. We also looked at demonetization, um, you know, as a, as a negative shock. Um, 
And what we find is that in rural areas, uh, so labor force participation rate was already declining. Okay. Um, but around November 2016, you see a sharp level decline. So the trend is the same, but there's a, there's a sharp level decline. Okay, so finally, uh, Indian women's labor force participation rate is marked by volatility and frequent transitions. One uh, issue in the whole labor force participation uh, discussion is that women's work is undercounted. That through NSS, you can talk about it in another way. In this way, what we are seeing is that women are not permanently out of the labor force. They enter and exit several times. And so if you just counted that, then in fact, uh, you will get a much higher estimate of labor force participation rates. The reasons for women's entry and exit are not the usual suspects, childbirth, change in incomes, seasonal factors, et cetera. Um, I already mentioned this. Um, and so what are the policy implications for this? Which is we need to alleviate the constraints that prevent women uh, from accessing jobs. But before that, growth needs to be employment intensive. You know, that we have to recognize that there's a crisis of jobs after all. And unless enough jobs are created, uh, you know, there can be gender gaps, but overall there will always be an issue of women um, and not in sufficient women being in the labor force. And of course, once jobs get created, additionally, you have to make sure that women are recruited for the jobs uh, that exist. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deshpande. Uh, please uh, send me your questions uh, or raise your hands and I'll call you out in that order. Uh, okay, Sarjit, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Deshpande, I'd also, uh, I was also a participant or a listener when you had presented this research to CMIE. And I wanted to ask you this question then also, but I didn't, so I'll ask you now. Just want you to know the the, you know, the kind of uh, this work that you have tracked, what are the industries that these women work in? Are they skilled, semi-skilled or unskilled? And then I can ask the question after that. There, there's a whole range. I mean, uh, you mean where the decline is the biggest? Rather, or, I mean, what, what have you been following? I mean, are these- All, all are... kinds of employment. It's not any okay. one sector. Okay, so it's not- Any as woman who says, any woman who declares her status as employed, or those two other categories, which is unemployed, willing and looking for work, or unemployed, willing, but not looking. Okay, so there could be skilled, semi-skilled or unskilled. Every, though there's a whole range. So we have so, the distribution across skill, we have the distribution across education, we have the distribution across all kinds of, yeah. Okay. The paper has all of these details. And so so from here, at the next question I want to ask is, is there any correlation between wages that they are paid and their dropout rates? So if a wage that they pay, they are paid is not remunerative or not magnetized them enough to stay in the job, then everything will, will act as a deterrent to keeping that job. And uh, the, 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 you know, the- Well, I mean, not from, everybody is a wage laborer. So, you know, there are self-employed women as well here. So, so, you know, there could be daily wages, there could be construction work. Um, and so- yeah, but um, this, this would point to the incomes, income story, which is, there's enough to eat in the family, so I'll only work if the pay is good enough, right? So, because so people have to live to to uh, people have to earn to live, right? So, if the livelihood uh, generation is sufficient, then women will not work unless they really have to. That's the that's the thing. So we do estimate the income effect also in our entry exit determinants. So the the reason why I ask this question is because you know, for example, the people in the workforce, the ladies who come and work in our homes. The house help they drop in and out as frequently as they can sometimes it's just because they want to go to their villages or sometimes it's planting season or you know harvesting season so does that mean that if they are transitioning out of one employment they're all they might be gainfully employed in another sector is there you know, i mean so in some case no so the way we define transitions it does we don't know who the employer is that is not the data doesn't ask that it just asks whether you're working or not so they were then, employer A or employer B, those are not the switches. 
And so for the skill then, you know, what about the maternity leave that they get? They do get an opportunity to be out of the workforce and or rather... Uh, yeah, so as long as they retain their employment, they are counted as employed. Yeah, so, so then I'm just trying to understand then what will, will be the biggest correlation or what will be the biggest factor that will uh, you know, link women's employment? Will it be the wages that they are paid or just the fact that... There are no jobs. That is the thing. There's there not enough no work. Jobs, so right? they, they work when they can work. See, that's the thing that this paper looks at all the factors that you've raised. So income effect, motherhood, marriage, you know, these are the usual suspects. You think this must be explaining it, but it doesn't. That is what this paper is trying to show. Because, you know, one of the newspapers reports a couple of weeks ago was that labor participation rate has dipped from 40 to 40, uh, from uh, to 46 to 40 percent from 46 percent overall. And women have been the largest uh, group affected by this labor. So that, that report was a little bit mischievous because they included unemployed. So increase in unemployment was seen as an increase in labor force participation rate. So yeah. we have to understand that there's a difference between labor force participation and employment. Yeah. Employment is a subset of labor force participation. So hypothetically, right. supposing all women said that they wanted to look for paid work, but say only 5% of women got jobs, yeah. right? And supposing 100% women said they want to look for paid work. We'll have a labor force participation rate of 100%. Yeah. Because 95% will be unemployed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think we as researchers, we must always be mindful of, are we talking about labor force participation rates or employment? No, I get that. Yeah. Thank you. I just was very curious, you know, because another researcher from Ashoka had come and pointed to the wage, uh, you know, disparity as being one of the primary reasons for uh, low participation rates of women workers, because the wages were just not compensated, you know, would just not compensate for their time. So, uh, I just wondering if there was any that would, you just think about it. When would you do that? So, what is the notion of a reservation wage? Which is, unless I get something above this, I'm not going to work. Yes. When can you say that? When you know that your two meals, five meals, whatever it is, yeah. your basic needs are provided for. Then I will say, okay, now, given that my basic needs are provided for, I will work if I get something attractive enough. You know, I will, I will see what the wage is and it's not worth it. But supposing you were starving, would you still say that? Yeah, exactly. Unlikely, right? So I think the, the narrative of, again, that doesn't mean that, so we need to understand the difference between a marginal effect. So something increasing the probability of or decreasing the probability of, you can always find that. But what is the overall magnitude of that effect? I mean, you look at India's per capita income, is it high enough that is India a rich enough country where most households can say, okay, women will work only if uh, you know we get we get well very high wage jobs. Otherwise, we are not working. Very rich individuals or families can do that. Yes. But India's uh, per capita GDP is not. We are not there yet. We are not even a properly middle income country. <laughs> We're still a low middle income country. Unfortunately, right? yes. and so LMICs. You know, so just think about the income distribution, think about the poverty incidence, think about correlate all these factors. So, and also we shouldn't confuse what you see in a regression result, which is just showing you the problem, holding everything else constant, this factor increases the probability of something. This factor decreases the probability of something. So th those are important markers. But what is the aggregate uh, employment or labor force participation rate that it explains? That's the question. What we are showing you is that all the supply side factors and wages, you know, only for people who are already employed, no? You, so all the wage data is coming from individuals who are already employed. So even, uh, uh, even in terms of econometrics, you can't predict that wage that people are getting that was already employed to someone who's not employed at all. And so, uh, just so for those question. who are not employed, there is no wage data. And so I wanted to, just last question, I'm so sorry to drag this, there are others also. Uh, uh, has Mandrega in any way affected the uh, participation rate for women? Yeah, yeah but Mandrega, what is, what is the average date of Mandrega work? It's now less, of course, they're not even getting the 100 days, yeah. in fact, less than 100. 100, there's never been 100. It's never been 100. Anyone knows what the average, the All India uh, average is, even pre-COVID? 
it was quite low. In fact, I think it, it's differential in different states. But if yeah, you yeah, but what is the national is, average? I think the national average comes to about 30 or 40. No, not even that. Hannah Jitendra, even 40 is too much, I think. Still, still yeah. 20, 15, 16 yeah. it was, but now it's not. No. 20, that's the number I remember. Yeah, so that's the number of, on average, that's, of course, there's huge variation across districts, yeah. across castes, across all of that. But that's the national average. So we are talking about 15, 20 days of work in a year. <laughs> yeah, thank you that so will much. Be, that will be, by the way, if there were such women in that in who worked for 15 days or 20 days, here in our data set will show up as an entry, an exit. Yeah. So they would have entered to work and then and they would exit. exit. That's what it will show up as. Thank you so much. Yeah. But always remember, and anyone who's listening, you know, wage data in these data sets is coming to us from people who are already employed. It is very problematic to use that wage data to those who are not employed and estimate the probability of whether they will join or not. I mean, labor economics, this is one of the biggest problems about what do you, how do you measure the anticipated wage? It's, it's in terms of a, a clean, estimation strategy, it's not at all straightforward. Because you don't know the wage the women would get if they were employed, or many one for that matter, not just women. That's not observed because they don't have a wage, right? Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, Gaurav. Yes. Yeah, all right, great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dr. Deshpande, for a very interesting talk, and uh, Jitendra as well. I understand that this is a lot of your dissertation research, right? Yeah. Uh, so the question that I had was, so you are, um, the, the result that you found is that a lot of supply, basically like a lot, of, a lot of the variation in the supply side factors explains very little of the variation of your dependent variable, right? Your, your Y variable, right? And so therefore, you know, you're kind of interpreting this to say that, you know, in the end, this means that the supply side factors actually don't really affect whatever the dependent variable is. But um, to my mind, I mean, very often when we're looking at, you know, regressions anyway, you know, we, we, we will find regression which will have very low R squares in any case, right? So that means that all the, you know, various explanatory variables that get thrown into your regression yeah, might end up only exp explaining, say, 2% or 4% of, you know, the variation in the Y variable. And so therefore, you know, if you anyway, if your regression um, anyway has very low R squares, it is therefore, you know, quite natural that all your various, you know, dependent, var independent variables or whatever they might be, will explain an even smaller, you know, share of the variation in the, uh, in, in, in the dependent variable. In which case, I mean, so therefore the result is not really surprising. It's just an artifact of the fact that you've run the regression and you've got a low R square, right? And that is not something that's uncommon. No. So the, the big difference between this regression, these regressions and any other work is that we see the same women enter and exit several times. It's not one cross section with low R square. That's not what's happening here. Yeah, you have a panel. No, no, so, panel. No, so, so, so get this. So normally, if you put, you run a cross-sectional regression with a bunch of supply side factors, and that might have lower, higher, R square, whatever it is, that's the scenario that you are describing. That's not, not what we are estimating. Huh? I'm not really, to, I mean, I didn't make the distinction. Distinct no, no, but that is a, this is, that's a, no, that's a critical point. Data no, 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 that is a critical point. We are not estimating LFPRs. We are saying that the low LFPR that you observe in any one cross-section masks the fact because if you recall my earlier slides, the LFPR, because it's a binary variable, you think that once a woman is out of the labor force, she's out of the labor force. If she's in the labor force, she remains in the labor force. That is what the cross-sectional, repeated cross-sectional data focuses on. That's also the reason why supply side factors become so important in the literature, apart from the fact that they're easier to measure because they can get, you can get that from the household survey. What are we showing here? Our panel is the same woman across over 12, uh, observed over 12 periods. So sometimes she's in the labor force, at other times the same woman is not in the labor force. What we want to see is what are the factors that pushed her into the labor force? What are the factors that determined her exit? 
it's the yeah. same woman that that makes all the difference why because supposing take take any of the supply side factors let's take uh stigma attached to paid work right let's say we all know the stigma is real stigma happens we are looking at a period of four years women who are stigmatized or their community stigmatized them their family stigmatized them that stigma will not repeatedly go up and down over a period of four years so it's not r square that's determining this can we look at the R squares in some of the regressions? Yeah, anyway? we have R squares every day, but the point is, it's a panel of the same woman entering and exiting. If stigma was an important factor for this family, it would not shift in a period of four years, every three months, every four months, sorry, three times in a year. Well, I mean, what we're seeing is, you know, you have your indicator variable that is switching on and off over, you know, your 12 time periods. And yes, you know, there might be some supply side factors which might be varying at a slower rate, but that does not necessarily mean that there might not still be some effect. That no, but then, so stigma increases, mm -hmm. so it can increase and stay there, or it can yeah. decrease and stay there. But you really think something like stigma can shift literally four months, uh, you know, every three months? Uh, households suddenly become stigmatized the woman and then they suddenly destigmatize suddenly community stigmatize come suddenly they destigmatize i mean there's no evidence of this at all anywhere in the anthropological literature in the we, you know in the sociological literature so yeah, stigma comes at, from honor you know the notion of yeah. women's honor so there are communities that value that a lot and you know therefore they this that's the that's the reason for the caste to gender overlap that's the reason yeah. for the stigma it doesn't shift there is no evidence at all of this shifting Motherhood, you know, it's a new child is born, woman can't go out to work. So you, you then you should see the R2 way fixed effects. It's a very rigorous methodology that we've done. We've done stack DID, two way fixed effects. It's like an event study. So you take the event as the birth of the child and you look at before and after of the same woman. See, the, it's a panel element of the estimation that makes it completely different from a cross section because the individual woman's characteristics are, are the same. The same person. It's no, the no, same I'm person. I, yeah, I, yeah. I'm buying your argument that you know the like the variation on the supply side factors might be a lot more gradual than the variation on your indicator variable. It right? doesn't. Uh, supply side factors are not volatile. That is the uh, Gaurav. That's I the problem that. you need to understand. I get it's that. Not that supply side factors don't change. Of course, they change. They can go up. They can go down. But they don't keep switching on and off, up and down, up and down. That's one. The second thing is that. I think you're still not appreciating the panel dimension of this. Of this, that's what makes it completely different from the regular R interpreting R square kind of a uh, because the individual person's characteristics are held constant, and then you're looking at the change. So whatever the attitudes, let's say attitudes, you can't, you have no data on attitudes, right? So you can have can a we, low R square. Right? Can we take a look at some of the results? I just wanted, you know, out yeah, of my sure, sure. The paper is also online, so. Yeah, you know, yeah, feel yeah. free to look at the paper um, also. Yeah, but uh, right now, if it's possible, just sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is, for example, some of the regression results, perhaps, right? Yeah. So this is, for example, the uh, no. This is a blind or Um This is the. These are the stack DID results. Yeah. No, I was I was trying to see if 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 the R squares were high or low because if the R squares were higher then i would say that you know that kind of oh, panel that's document. not such a big deal gaurav it's a panel it's the same woman i'm Who's aware i mean i'm aware that you know time, time series you know time series analyses will have much higher r squares it's not you know. time series it's panel i agree i agree so panel will generally be it's a cross section and time series cross section it'll be lower than the you know a time series i appreciate that but i'm just you know out of my curiosity i just wanted to take a look if that's all uh, right just just to uh like gaurav uh, yeah. Just to sort of Go ahead. Uh, add to Gaurav's point here, like yeah. uh, you have also put in fixed effects. So a lot of those uh, women-specific factors are removed, right, Ashwini? We're already removing no, it. So we have Gaurav. two kinds of regressions. We right. have two so, kinds so of that's something also. Uh, yeah. So we have two kinds of regressions. One is, yeah. So these are the, for example, the entry. Uh, yeah. yeah. So and when we look at the change, yeah. Model. So when we look at the change in log income, yeah, we don't put individual fixed effects. When we look at the level of log income, we put individual fixed effects. Right. 
Yes. And your R squares so, are very low. So right? as I said, in, the, in, in column one and two, it's, it's pretty small, so, but then when you're putting individual fixed effects, it sort of increases. Yeah, okay. so then the explanatory power improves. Yeah. Yes, uh, and yeah. another thing is that these are linear probability models, am I right? Even they are DID, but they are linear probability models. Right, Ashwini? Yeah, it's a, so, it's, yeah, probably, yeah, but- Yeah, so, so again, again, we had to think about, okay, what does an R square mean, irrespective of uh, how well the panel is able to uh, capture the information they're interested in, because linear property uh, R squares are not easily interpreted. Econometrically speaking, actually, uh, we are not even interpreting the R squares. You guys yeah, yeah, are interpreting exactly. the R squares. So, which, again, means, so feel free to get that, but we are not interpreting. Yeah, which again means the standards yeah. uh, 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 that you you calculate will have it will have a sort of a so, some sort of inferential value that needs to be sort of these needs to be sparsed out because it's an LPM. So, say I were to do this with a ordered logic based upon entry exit rates. Uh, and see whether the results would change. Uh, that would be one. Why, why would it be about why an ordered logic is just one variable? Uh, so the, I was thinking about rank ordering the exit entry rates among your population panel, and then sort no, of. why? That's something the number that, of switches is not is not is not. You're just looking at the probability of a switch. Yeah, you're looking at the extensive margin. Yeah, you're looking at the extensive. Yeah, we are not margin. looking at the number of switches. Right. Right. So that would be interesting to compare and contrast with the extensive margin. Because each time there is a switch, yeah. what has what changed? That's what we are looking at. And, and just one more point here, this is something I, I had raised my hand for, is seasonal migration. So I have a paper where I actually find that the effect of minimum wages uh, sort of declines once you sort of account for the factor that people prefer to work in, in, in jobs that are closer to their homes. So if you look at, if you look at, uh, even if I remove the gender dimension and were to just look at uh, migration, uh, job picking among rural to urban uh, migration, I mean, among rural people coming into urban areas is that they don't want to travel too far away. So one factor that comes to my mind is the fact that you find women entering and exiting at such a high rate compared to men is that they don't prefer to work away from their home they prefer to work, but not away from the home. So if I were to account either some sort of a variable that captures that distance factor or the difficulties of migration, uh, would, wouldn't that maybe absorb the effect that you are finding, uh, you know, in terms of when you decompose the total effect? Maybe that, that, that unexplained part would be explained. That's simply another hypothesis I had. Yeah, so the distance of, I'm trying to go back to the point where I was showing you the NSS results. Right. Um, so this data set, and as far as I know, neither NSS gives you the distance from the residence to the place of work. I'm, I'm not aware of any such data set. If you, if you have some, you should let me know. Uh, yeah. So, so obviously we can't, uh, you know, we'll have to ask this question. Uh, yeah, but but there, is, there is questions of migration in CMI data. Yeah. So this is exactly, uh, this is exactly what, uh, earlier work has highlighted, which is that it's the predominant responsibility of reproductive labor that doesn't allow women to access work that's far away from home. This is a well-known fact um, about India. Mm -hmm. I mean, my own paper also talks about it, but I'm not the only one. There are many, many papers that talk about it, right? So yes, so norms have to change. Men have to step up and do the housework so that if there's a job available, women, and there's transportation, uh, unfortunately, so um, what if I were to include some sort of a share of migrate uh, migrants in terms of distance travel in your specification on the extensive margin? Would that change your results? Is that simple? I'm trying to sort of figure out maybe some sort of proxy measure of these season. are not these these individuals. To the best of my knowledge, are not migrants. These are uh, we have taken individuals. I'm trying to go to the last slide. Um, okay. We've taken individuals that are observed in all the 12 waves. Right. Um, yeah, so the distance to work, I mean, uh, you know, you should let me know if you have any ideas on how that can be done. But as far as I know, there is, uh, unless you do your own survey, the regular data sets. I mean, again, here the idea is again to use some sort of a, a, a kind of a, a, a pull factor uh, analysis. So the idea is that we have in India, either minimum wages in certain sectors that are very attracting, uh, that attracts women a lot, or you have the Manrega and use those 
uh, weight changes to sort of create spatial bands to, to run regressions. That's the only approach that I can think of straight on, on top of my head. Uh, but that's a very indirect approach. Uh, so you are essentially dividing your sample by that band, spatial bands that you develop. But my, my only point is that you are showing us a large unexplained part from this that is not explained by the supply side factor. And that's evident. My, my point is that mechanisms are not yet clear. And the second point that I was trying to raise was migratory effects. Like if I were to account for this distance issue in job selection, would that sort of explain uh, this unexplained part? That, that's so the first, I mean, I don't know uh, how one would account for a distance issue for yeah. a job that hypothetically exists because right. it would have to exist first of all. And right. even for men, labor force participation rates have gone down. So. Uh, even pre-COVID, I mean, COVID is not even a question. So the fact that there are there isn't enough work available to absorb the growing working for, working population is 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 a fact. Mm -hmm. And within that, there are gender gaps. So in fact, the last point on this slide is one of the policy recommendations that comes out of our paper is precisely transportation and you know um, policies that will alleviate a woman's domestic chores. So, for example, child good, decent child care centers, uh, either near their workplace or near home where the woman can be canteens, which doesn't where the woman can eat, or where the husband can eat, so she doesn't have to cook, or the children can eat. So these are and these are policies that have been tried out in different countries right. uh, that have boosted female labor force participation rates because they alleviate domestic chores. Okay. So it's not as though supply side factors don't matter at all. In fact, the first few slides were precisely to establish that. But the point is that that doesn't explain the repeated entry and exit. Even domestic chores, I mean, there are families in which the domestic chores are high and they are low, and that can change, you know, entry of a new person, death of a person, et cetera. But they don't change every four months. I mean, you think about your own households, you know, every four months, it's not as though you'll have a whole influx of new people or a whole exit of, I mean, that will be very, very rare, that'll happen. So even domestic chores, that, will, that explains the low level. But I'm not sure that it explains the decline over but, time. Uh, that is fair enough. Uh, I have one more question from one of the uh, audience member, uh, Utkash Chaudhary. Uh, the question is: uh, Does age of the child will be a, uh, will be a potential factor for exiting and entering the labor force for women? Suppose women have children aged less than five years for exiting and fifteen years or above for entry. Yeah, so, so we looked at that. We looked at that. We looked at women with le children less than five years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Utkash, do you have any follow up or are you, are you satisfied? Yeah, that's that's fine, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Right. Uh, I think it was a pretty, I must say, uh, it was a very uh, sort of uh, a very interesting paper. Uh, that's why so many questions have come up. No, that, that's and, good. And this is definitely, good yeah, and this is definitely yeah. a very hot topic, right? I mean, to really explain why women don't participate that much in the labor force, right? And uh, so for all you labor economists, economists or would be labor economists out there, I mean, this is a very, a very interesting area to work in uh, for, uh, for further research. So uh, Ashwini, uh, Jitendra, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. It was, it was lovely having you here. And yeah, I, I wish you all the best. And, and this paper definitely has made a contribution in terms of the various decomposition that you've just illustrated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I did. The paper is available online. It's changing also actually because we've collected comments from conferences and we are, we are making a few changes. But the one, it's, uh, one draft is available already on the ISA, uh, IZA, IZA work, uh, website. Um, today, because it was the one hour, I mean, I was supposed to speak for 35, 40 minutes. Plus, uh, Rohan said uh, that there might be a lot of undergraduate students, so I skipped the technical uh, slides, but all the technical detail is in the paper. So feel uh, free to please engage with it and you know, send us an email if, uh, right. if you have any uh, ways in which we can more directly estimate the demand side, that would be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. my pleasure.